Thank you so much for joining us today for Declaration's online message. I'm Daniel, one of your pastors at Declaration. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We wanna know more about you and for you to know more about who we are. I wanna invite you to text CONNECT to 43000. You will receive a link to an online connection card. So do me a favor, fill it out. We wanna connect with you. Also, everyone's invited to attend our in-person worship services every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. at Snyder Elementary in Spring, Texas. Hey, check out this video of some upcoming events you don't want to miss. Hello, Declaration family. I'm Aaron, and I want to take a minute to fill you in on some things you don't want to miss. So whether you're joining us online or in person, welcome to church. Join us for a life-changing experience you won't want to miss called 21 Days of Prayer. During this season, we will intentionally seek God in prayer and believe for Him to move in powerful ways. Text 21 Days to 43,000 and get a link to sign up and find out more about 21 Days and how to receive daily devotionals. We hope you join us for this incredible 21-day journey as we seek the heart of God together. Our next group semester is coming up and you are free to lead at Declaration. In fact, we want you to. Remember, leading a group isn't about being perfect. It's about serving others by giving them a place to connect. It's as easy as taking what you already do and inviting others to do it with you. Whether it's playing basketball, doing crafts, praying, doing a Bible study, or even running, we all have something to offer and God's love can reach others through you. For more information or to register your group, visit declaration.org or stop by the Connection Center. Declaration family, we are called to radical generosity and irresistible hospitality. Mark 10 reminds us that our investment in God's economy over the world's economy is a reflection of where our trust truly lies. Giving a declaration is a simple two-step process. Ask the Lord what He would have you give and then be obedient. There are a few ways you can give through Declaration. You can text GIVE to 43000, you can visit declaration.org slash give, or you can drop your giving in a box at one of the response tables. If you are visiting for the first time, we want you to know that we consider you a part of the family and we would love to get to know you. Do us a favor and text CONNECT to 43000 and fill out a connection card right on your phone. You can also scan the seat back in front of you or find a connection card at the response tables. All right, that's all we have for you now. You can find more information about everything you heard today at declaration.org or the Connection Center in the lobby. We're so glad you joined us for worship today. Hey Church Pastor John here. We have had a great few weeks away since we left camp. We, we came to Destin. You know, we often joke we should put a campus here and I'm ready when you are. But, but just wanted to say this week for Mixtape, we are so excited. We've got such a great voice, such a great person that's going to be coming to speak. In fact, this person was actually instrumental in a lot of my spiritual formation when I was a teenager, even though from a distance. He is a man of vision. He is a man of passion. His heart beats wild for Jesus and people. And I'll say this, um, man, we are so honored and privileged to be his house, his sending church. He is our missionary in residence. Would you please put your hands together, scream as loud as you can, and welcome Rick Eubanks. Wow. Well, it's an honor to be home. Uh, I'm gone quite a bit, and you may not see me awful, an awful lot. That's because we're uh, not sloughing. Let's put it that way. We're busy. Uh, it's almost time for school to start. It's tomorrow for a lot of people. And I wonder if Christ came on campus tomorrow, what he would see, what he would think, and what he would feel in Spring, Texas. Uh, a lot of people ask me, you're an old guy. Why do you still do what you do and you're not retired? I don't know what else I'd do, by the way. But I want to show you a scripture from Psalm 71, 17 through 18. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all who come. That next generation, we've got to proclaim the power of God to this one and the next one that's not born yet. They're worth it. So if Jesus walked on campus, how would he feel? 
Uh, I'm working with a group called Movement DFW, and we've done some research, and I want to share that research with you. Uh, it's something I, I almost wish I didn't know, but it's something we need to consider. If we can go to that slide, we're going to start with uh, our losses. I don't know if we have that up there or not, but basically this. If churches stay status quo right now, no changes, we're going to lose 35 to 50 million young people, not just from the church, but also from the faith by the year 20. 50. Less than a half of young people in the U.S. identify as Christian right now. And only 8% of those do Christian habits. They have Christian habits. That means 8% might have been discipled and read the Bible. They pray, believe that, that Jesus is God. Those simple things that we might take for granted. Only 8% pray at least weekly. Believe the Bible is the Word of God. 62% that's almost two-thirds leave by age of 18, and I think sometimes that's a little earlier than that. So there's mental health issues and depression and abuse and suicide. They're all increasing at an alarming rate. And uh, one leader said young people today find themselves thrust into an adult world without the time, opportunity, or desire to grow up emotionally. So they're thrust into this world. And our research showed that they thought the church was a couple of things. I'm going to show you what those are. First of all, they said the church was irrelevant. So they have tough questions, and we're not answering the questions they're asking. We're, we're shooting over their head. Uh, and we need to know what they're asking and listen to them. We're not listening. We're not hearing their questions. Also, they said the church is unloving. It means that people that are different than us, sometimes we don't love them. And by the way, this church does so much right. I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of this body that's an example to others. I wish I could take the DNA of declaration all across the state of Texas and replicate it because I'm so glad to be a part of this place because unloving is not our church. But they say it is. It's lack of care for people that are different. It's going to churches where they sing just as I am, but they don't really mean it. They also say that we're inauthentic, that we're not real, that we're fake, and we seem to manipulate people uh, into thinking things that... that uh, that we are just impressing them the things that we believe and not allowing them to become self-feeders. And I want them to become self-feeders. There's also a big need for heroes, just adults who care and who listen and have a spiritual impact. They did a, an experiment, not a spiritual experiment, but they had 10 kids that were doing terrible in math. And they gave them all a mentor, a, a caring adult across the table. After three months, those kids that were failing in math started increasing their grades and doing great. And the thing about it was not one of those 10 adults across the table from them knew anything about math. They were just the caring person across the table, listening and, and working with that student. So if current trends continue, the dropout rate of students, plus my older generation, we're going away. And plus the fact that there's a rise of spiritual nuns, it's the fastest growing uh, religion in the United States is we have no affiliation. The church will be at half of its current uh, attendance by the year 2050. And Christianity will be a, will be a minority religion and Muslim will be a, uh, the majority. No church is immune from this statistic, by the way. And right now, almost half of the world is 25 years and younger. That's why I still do what I do because the next generation matters. An example of the problem, you might remember South Korea had a great revival a few years back, Prayer Mountain and things like that. South Korea was blowing and going, and that was great for the, the parents and the grandparents, but they forgot the next generation, and now they're losing 10 churches for every one they plant because they forgot the next generation. So it's time to move from the, the status quo. History is going to remember us as either a dark age, uh, uh, the, for, for the dark age, another dark age, or a great spiritual awakening. I'm for a great spiritual awakening. How about you? I believe that God's doing some great things. I saw it at camp this summer. I've heard about camps all summer. God is moving. There's a bridge in Honduras. It's real interesting. It's a, a metaphor for a lot of things, but it's the Cholo Tica Bridge in Honduras. It was built in the 90s. But in 1998, an it's an indestructible bridge, very, very beautiful. In 1998, a hurricane came through and everything changed. The bridge is there and it goes nowhere because the river moved. And I would say, in a lot of ways, that bridge represents the church today. The culture is over here, and many ministers have been trained for a world that no longer exists. 
So, I know you believe with me, though, that we can see a spiritual awakening. I heard a great song this morning, Ben Fuller. It says, but the cross says that's not right. That uh, we're not doomed with things that are going on. And there's, there's hope in Jesus. And so that's why I do what I do. Because he, uses, he usually works through his people. And that's what I want to do is work through uh, his people to see a great spiritual awakening. We need to pray. So if Jesus came to spring, what would he think? Would he say, those kids won't listen? Would he be cynical? Would he be threatened? No, he would feel compassion. The cross says they're wrong. Ben Fuller. Passion for God. And a compassion for people always leads to missional action. Our passion, and I love, that's what I love about my church, our church. We're for God, we're for people. Amen? That's what, that's what Jesus said, bottom line to the Pharisees, love God, love others. That's the bottom line. We get a glimpse of what Jesus felt and, and how he responded to people in Matthew chapter 9, which is where we're going to hang out today. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease, every, and every affliction. That's the backstory of Matthew 9 here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That paragraph summarizes Jesus. The, the activity of Jesus, teaching, preaching, and healing. Did you know that Jesus was a youth pastor? In Matthew 17, Peter says, uh, says, says to Jesus, you know, it's tax time. And so Jesus says, go fishing, go find a fish, and you'll find a coin in his mouth. It's a shekel. Remember that story? Maybe you've not heard. It's a great story, Matthew 17. Half a shekel was simple tax back then. People that paid tax had to be 20 years and older. And so we know that Jesus said, pay our taxes. And so Jesus was over 20, we know, about around 30. Peter was married, probably over 30. But did you know that you became a man at age 12 back in that culture? And they, young men began to follow rabbis at age 13 to 15. That's when they began. We see these pictures of Matthew looking like he's 140 years old. No. So they were mostly young people, probably below age 20. So Jesus was a youth pastor with one adult sponsor and one really bad kid. So Matthew 9 refers to the multitude, people in the towns and the villages, all kinds. Tomorrow, when school happens, that's the kind of crowd he sees. He'd see cheerleaders and teams. He'd see handicapped people. He'd see educators. He would see janitors. He'll see some, some band kids coming in, uh, a lot of t-shirts with all kinds of things on them. And some are, are, are laughing together and one might be crying going in and some will be traveling together and a lot of them will be walking alone. But looking at their array of emotions, they'll see joy and anger, and they'll see depression, and they'll see despair, joy, who knows. But we'll see a bunch of made-in-the-image-of-God people walking in, desperate for something that feels like love and acceptance, right? That's what he would see, purpose and identity. So, and most of them may not know that Jesus is the answer, but they're searching deep down inside for something worth living and dying for. That's the kind of crowd Jesus sees, all kinds of people. He had extraordinary patience and perseverance and a high tolerance uh, for spiritual immaturity, did he not? In Matthew 9, we see a real key to his discipleship plan, what he did. His life was a moving classroom. Did you know that? Every day he goes out and his disciples go with him and he takes them with him. What a way to minister. His life was a mission trip 24-7. That's the challenge. And here's the backstory of some of the crowd in Matthew 9. We see as he went, as they were going, as he went into the next house, the disciples were always with him watching, learning how to minister. That's discipleship, being together and taking someone with, with him. If you have Matthew 9, there's a lot of chapter titles on that. I just want to go through the backstory here. The first story is when the men got the paralytic and lifted him through the roof because nobody could get back in. So they tore up the roof, and let four of them let the man down. They did whatever it took to get people to Jesus, get their friend to Jesus. That's a pretty good teaching there. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, are there taking notes and saying, who are you? Who do you think you are? Because it's a lot easier to be a sermon critic than it is to be a stretcher carrier. That's what they were all about. So Jesus heals the man, and they said, we've never seen anything like this. And they were all struck with awe. 
The next scene, Matthew himself, is who's writing this, recalls inviting Jesus over to his house so his friends can meet Jesus. The tax collector. The, the, he's eating with sinners is what the religious people go. and It's like Jesus went, so? Yes. And so he ate with sinners. And even called, that one, called Matthew to be one of his followers. They're wondering what he's doing. And he, he mentions wineskins. And what that means is, well, the old covenant did this. It was about sacrifices and priests. He said, this new covenant's about grace and mercy and love and what I'm going to do on the cross one day. That's what the new covenant is all about. And you'll see that. But that'll stretch you. So new wine has to be put in new wineskins. It'll stretch you. There's a new way of life. And the next scene is the synagogue leader whose daughter had just died. Yet, he, re- he, he risked his reputation to say, Jesus, would you help me? Because he knew that Jesus was the only place he could go to get that help. So on their way to heal, uh, to raise the dead, actually, the woman touched him. The woman with the issue of blood. And, and, and she, she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. And then they laughed at Jesus when he said, she's only sleeping. And so he raised the girl from the dead. By the way, back then, you don't touch women, you don't touch blood, and you don't touch dead people. Jesus was a rule breaker, although he makes the rules, does he not? He is God. He is God come to earth in the flesh. So the two blind men are, 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 are yelling at Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, that we might have our sight. Boom, Jesus heals them that they may have their sight. A demon-possessed man that couldn't talk because of whatever the situation was with the demons, he he was mute. And so Jesus healed him. That's what's going on. Notice that he didn't talk about externals in any of this. He didn't say, well, you're not dressed right. You don't look right. Externals, not even mentioned in there. Externals have kept more of our young people away, I think, than anything in churches. One time I had a well-meaning deacon. I've worked with a guy for two years, taking him on mission trips, sharing the gospel with him. And he was walking down, down the hall. I think he had a Budweiser shirt on, baggy pants, and his hat was sideways. And the deacon, I guess in charge of dress code, says, we don't wear stuff like that around here, boy. And so he was not around here anymore. He left because of externals. Jesus sees past your T-shirt. He doesn't see Budweiser. He sees your face. He looks at people. He doesn't see baggy pants. He doesn't see the hat sideways. He sees the imprint of him on that life once he's touched that life. He walked through the crowd slowly. Not for people who had it all together. Isn't that good news? Not for people that look like us and think like us or always agree with us. He walked through the crowd slowly. Not for people who had it all together. And that is good news to me. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Spiritually dead people. So we see a glimpse of what he did. Here's what he didn't do. He didn't ask the religious leader, why should I help you? He didn't need assurance that the religious leader would become a part of his church or become his follower. He didn't explain why he did what he did to the disciples. He didn't worry about how his actions would be looked at by other people. He didn't tell the bleeding woman to make an appointment. Jesus made his rules for making the good news and look what happened. Compassion, by the way, is a gift every Christian has because we have Jesus in our heart. It's how Christ cared, and it just moves us to do that. So a few things that are keys to being like Jesus in this passage. First, we need to feel like Jesus felt. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion, the multitude. Uh, Compassion has a double meaning, and I'm not going to go with the original Greek word, but I'll tell you what they mean. If I was coming to church this morning and I heard a baby crying in a dumpster, do you think I'd wait and call the, the fire department? You wouldn't. I would jump right in with my clothes, just like I am right now. I'd do something about it right then. Compassion means we have to do something about it right now. And it also comes from an idea of a pain in the gut. Movement as, as, as in the bowels. You hurt and then you do something about it. It's like when you heard about the shooting in Uvalde. That was the feeling. All of a sudden, compassion went off in you. That's what that's about. It always leads to involvement. And that's asking God that he would break our hearts over the same thing that breaks his heart. And my mentor, Dave Busby, called it being God with skin onto people. Where we flesh out, we become the hands and feet of Jesus, where we move with compassion. And why did he feel that way? Because he saw people like they were. He saw past their t-shirt. He saw past their past and their situation. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks what? At the heart. So let's get real, church. 
Jesus saw them and he saw that they were harassed and helpless in this version. Maybe your version says distressed and downcast. Those two words are, are really interesting. Distressed, you take a new piece of furniture and you take a piece of barbed wire and you beat it up. Why? To give it character. Who knows? There are people probably around here today that have jeans that have been distressed, brand new pair of jeans. Somebody took a brick, rubbed on it, jacked up the price about 25 bucks and you bought it. You have distressed jeans. Distressed, actually in the original language, is, it's, it's really violent. It means to be raped, flayed and mangled as by a wild lion. It's like the Discovery Channel where the lion goes after the gazelle and everybody goes, ah, okay. That's distressed, torn shredded. Downcast is the next word. You think about a sheep when he's going to bring up sheep because Jesus talked about sheep a lot. It's not a compliment. Uh, a sheep when it falls over, it's a cast sheep. Now that sheep, just like a June bug, is going to lay there like that until the shepherd comes and puts it on its feet again. I've been downcast. It means falling so hard you can't get up. I was playing basketball in the park one time, and some, for some reason, a guy was like this under the backboard, and I went up for a, a rebound. I rolled down his back and hit pike position like this on the concrete. I fell so hard I couldn't get up for about 14 minutes. That's what it means to be downcast. Now, do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody that's been beat up, that, that's, that's on their back, unless somebody writes them, someone that that's, the world has torn up? Uh, torn them to shreds, maybe their family, maybe their situations like that, that harassed and helpless. Yes, you know people like that, like sheep without a shepherd. It's incredible. Uh, sheep without a shepherd, they're desperate for the shepherd. Sheep are dumb. Did you know that? They, they forget where they ate. I can, I can at least remember that. They will not drink if water is moving. That's why he leads me besides still waters. See Psalm 23. A sheep, if there's a break in the fence, will find a thousand ways out of that. And once one sheep goes out, the rest of the sheep will follow. It's like junior high ministry. <laughs> one sheep goes off a cliff, all the sheep go off a cliff. But here's, here's the story there. Not one of those will find their way back without the shepherd. And that's what we've got to show them as the shepherd. So we need to see as Jesus saw. We need to pray as Jesus prayed. He prayed. Prayer, prayer is the key. And we need a movement of prayer across the United States. And it's starting to happen. We're seeing movements of prayer all over the place. And so today's a call to connect. Uh, and if we've ever needed it, it's today, right now. Not just transition time. Hey, it's time to begin the service. Let's pray. Service is over. Let's pray. It's like intentional intercession where we take time and we set aside time and we pray for students and educators and leaders and we pray for our, our national leaders. We pray for a movement and God will hear because Second Chronicles 714, when Solomon built the temple, he told us what to do in case of crisis. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and I will restore, heal their land. Do we need that? We have to pray. So why do we do that? Well, prayer defies the odds. 120 people before Pentecost, they're praying. The whole culture, the whole world is against them. But today, one third of the world is Christian, 300 billion people, because 120 people got together and prayed way back when. So prayer beats the odds. In 1795, Lyman Beecher noticed the alarming decline of, uh, de decline of faith in colleges and campuses, Harvard, Yale, places like that. And most students were atheists and skeptics were honored as a big deal. And Christians had to meet secretly because they were so unpopular. But they worshiped and they prayed. And when things looked hopeless, God orchestrated some of the great awakenings in America. Isn't that good news today? Okay, so I'm, I'm hopeful. It's going to be good. I'm saying, do it again, Lord. Do it again. And the Bible here says, Jesus said, okay, pray to the Lord of the harvest or ask the Lord of the harvest. Ask is a really funny word. It's not what the original language means. Ask here means beseech the Lord of the harvest. That means beg the Lord of the harvest. My, both of my girls were really good at beseeching, especially if we got to the checkout counter at the grocery store and there was a Pez head they didn't have yet. Daddy, please. Daddy, 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 please. Okay, I don't have this one. Daddy, please. After they got through, you know what I did? 
they, they walked out with two of them, not just one of them, because I love my kids. They beseech me really good. It means to get a hold of God and rattle his cage. God gives us the privilege to pray until something happens. Isn't that great? We can beseech him, beseech the Lord of the harvest, bother him. Prayer is such a privilege. And we can be willing to be used by the Holy Spirit. And we always need to, need to pray with action because he said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. The next chapter, Jesus is going to send them all out. He's talking about them because when we pray to the Lord of the harvest, something gets inside of us. We pray, we start to care, and then we realize the gospel is the only answer. And so we want to share the gospel. So we pray and we care and we share. Prayer leads us to action. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. Prayer is the engine that runs it all. So we need to do as Jesus did. Be the church together. Be his disciples. Do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. And you already have what you need because uh, 1 Peter 1.3 says, We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. It was all given to us by God's own power when we learned that he'd invited us to share in his wonderful goodness. So we can get out of our comfort zone and invest in people. By the way, that's hard work. And I want to tell you, I want to brag right now. Let's say encourage. Let's don't use the word brag. On a bunch of adults from Declaration that went in 105 degree heat to 220 camp, Paul setting up the, the fundraiser, all of our adults, the worship team, the tech team, all there serving students in 105 degree heat so that the next generation will hear about Jesus and have an experience and their life will never be the same. And 45 can be called to the ministry. You're adults. Let's give them a hand, huh? Love your people, love those people, love your staff. 42% of staff members, pastors, leaders are thinking about leaving the ministry right now. Why? It's just hard. After the pandemic and things are going on, we're trying our best to fill up churches with pastors and youth pastors and worship leaders because it's just so stinking hard. But if you love your staff and their family, please love them well. They're awesome. You have such a good staff here, such wonderful people, and they serve you. And by the way, everyone here is called to the ministry. Did you know that? And it's your leadership's job to equip you, the saints, for the ministry. That's what Ephesians 4 says. And you have people that want to do that. And so just love your staff. I'll just say that for free. Ken Erke says this. So when Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, my heart almost stops. There's a beautiful crop ready to be brought in and no one to do it. I know immediately the sense of urgency for the call for workers. Send forth laborers means literally to push them out with or without violence, to shove them on out and tell him what to do. He's going to do it in Matthew 10. He's going to tell them, go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. I showed you how to do it. Now you guys go do it. Push them out, get them out, get the good news to people. Moving classroom on mission together, then he sent them. So are you willing today to be moved with compassion? Would you like to be the person that walks through the crowd, the crowd slowly and doesn't see the t-shirt, looks past the t-shirt, looks up at their face like Jesus did? See past their externals. See past someone's past. Because the past is gone, is it not? The future is in Jesus' hands once he takes over. Be moved with compassion. Help me. What I'm doing is helping to try to change the trajectory of Christianity for the next generation. That sounds like a bold vision. Well, good. Bring it on. Because somebody has to do that. We want to change the trajectory. We want to not lose a million kids. We want to win a million kids for Jesus Christ. So I'm praying for people to go with me, to be laborers. What would happen if we got on our knees and begged God and beseeched God and say, we'll do whatever it takes to make that happen? Jesus left the comfort zone of heaven and came down so he could get into the trenches with us. Vance Havner said, the tragedy of today is that the situation is desperate and the saints aren't. In the Jesus Revolution uh, movie, Lonnie Frisbee, uh, played by Jonathan Rumi, asked Chuck Smith, uh, Kelsey Grammer, when was the last time you were desperate? Boy, that phrase just nailed me when I saw that movie. When was the last time you were desperate? These statistics, do they make you desperate for God to do something great? Are we okay with losing a million kids a year? That's 3,000 a day, by the way, from the faith. I'm not okay with that. So here's some practical things you can do. We've, we've looked at these after looking at the research. Here's some practical things. And praise God, Declaration does these things. And they're, they're doing them and they're doing them well. 
First, pray, care, and share. Beseech the Lord. I see people before services praying. I see a prayer team up at camp just there to pray, to pray with kids, to pray with students. It's so incredible because we want to pray and care and share. We want to share the gospel. A church has to grow young or it's going to grow old and it's going to die. And so growing young means we prioritize young people in every way that we possibly can because they're a big deal. Our, our youth, our children, they're, they're a big deal. Also, we let them be the church. There are, there are students this morning serving everywhere. I'm so excited to see that. Some churches wait until they grow up. By the way, there's no junior Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Same Holy Spirit lives in a 13-year-old that lives in your me. Let them be the church. They have gifts and talents and need to be part of the overall ministry now, not when they grow up one day. They're the church. Give them heroes who listen. Every student needs a hero. Think for a second, who was your hero? Why are you here today? Who made the difference so that you would want to seek after God? It's a grandma. It's a, grand, it's a, it's a mom. It's a coach. It's a teacher. It's a Sunday school teacher. It's somebody. It was a friend, a next door neighbor, somebody at church. They made a difference for you. Everyone needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Did you know that? Everyone needs someone speaking into their life. Everyone needs someone encouraging them. And everyone needs someone they're investing in. At least one person. Young people need an atmosphere of love and acceptance powered by prayer. I love seeing that here. That's why Asbury Revival happened. It was very simple and organic. Students just said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And pray they did. And God moved. Students need to be empowered and equipped and mentored and sent out on mission. Just like Jesus took his youth group out, we need to do that too. Put them in situations where they have to depend on Jesus. The older generation needs to be praying and begging God to be sent right along with young people, by the way. I encourage you to learn, adults, learn the name of some of the students here. Learn their names and give them a pound when you see them and ask them how it's going. Learn to ask, tell me about it. Sometimes we want to teach somebody immediately if they're having trouble, but sometimes we just need to say, tell me about it. That's a great parenting term. Why are you, hurt? Why are you hurting? What's going on? Tell me about it. Let them talk. We can't say when I was your age, by the way, because what they're going through right now, we were never their age. So we can't say that right now. So we need to give them lasting truth so they know why they believe what they believe. And we need to make students independently dependent upon Jesus Christ on their own. And they can do that. Jesus was moved with compassion. He modeled care and prayer and share. He looked past their stuff. The love of Jesus, what is it? It's his compassion flowing through us to them. Compassion always leads to action, and it's urgent. It wants to do something about it right now. How about you? Are you willing to do what it takes? Do you want to be a laborer? We have small groups. You could be a leader. There's all kinds of leadership opportunities at Declaration. I challenge you not to be a pew sitter. It's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John sits in pews. It's the book of what? Acts. It means get after it. Here's some practical things you can do today. If you want to, I'm going to be here to lead a prayer walk for Snyder Elementary School at six o'clock. Students are going to be doing what they do. That's great. If you're an adult or a child and you'd like to come, we're going to have a prayer walk at Snyder Elementary School and we're going to pray. You can go learn this. When you go through a school zone, pray for that school. Let it click immediately. Pray for that school. Pray for the students. Pray for the educators. Later on, Pastor Aaron at the end is going to pray over our educators and our children today. Get equipped, get trained. Learn to care. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, The things that I've taught you, teach the other person, somebody that's faithful and reliable, so that they'll teach someone, they'll teach someone else. That's what discipleship looks like. So get trained, get equipped. Also share, learn the gospel. There's a simple app. If you've never shared the gospel, Life in Six Words is the app. You can go, you can download it and learn what the gospel is. There's a dare to this too, hopefully for students, download the app that says nine month mission trip or go to nine month mission trip.com because mission trip for students starts tomorrow. If school starts because they're in school from September to May, we know where they are. If we empower them and equip them to be missionaries, then from the inside out, they can see themselves as someone not just trying to pass from eighth to ninth grade, but it's God's representative, his ambassador on that campus. Starting today, you can be God with skin on to somebody. Compassion leads to action. So do what it takes to reverse the trend. Now, as far as me, I don't want to lose another student from the faith. And we have a group together and we've said, not on our watch. 
I don't want to be known as the generation that took us into the next spiritual dark age. Do you? I want to see a great spiritual awakening. So with me today, I hope you'll join me and say not on my watch. Amen. I'm going to ask you to pray uh, bow your heads just for a moment because you may be here today and you may be that very person I was talking about that's distressed and downcast. Just bow your head and close your eyes. Pray for people here that might need to come to Jesus for the first time ever. Maybe you heard about Jesus today and you were saying, God, I'll give you one more chance. Well, we're talking about the Jesus that sees past your past sees past the stuff that you've done. He's bigger than any mistake. He loves you with an everlasting love. He has compassion for you. Our sin separates us, but he said, I died on the cross for you, was buried and rose again so that you can be free. Everyone who trusts Christ alone has eternal life. And life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. If you'd like to just say today and, and just pray, God, I know you love me. I, I know that my sin has separated me, but I don't want to be separated. I want to, I, I want to be restored, and I actually want to be on the team that's helping other people be restored. Lord, make me the person you want me to be. The best way I know how, I give you my life today for the first time ever. Lord, become the boss of my life. Lead me the rest of my life. I'll follow you. If you're that person today, if you've never said that, would you just quickly just raise your hand and put it down? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, just put your hand up and then put it right back down. Anyone? Okay, then I'll assume everyone here is called to the ministry. That means you're called to be equipped and you're called to pray and you're called to share and you're called to care. And so my dare today is that you'll say, Lord, I'll do what it takes to get people to you. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. We worship you, God. Thank you that mountains bow down and the seas roar at the sound of your name. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for the example you set. Help us to learn how to pray, to care, and to share in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you so much for checking us out online today. If you need to make a decision about the next steps in your faith journey with Jesus, text CONNECT to 43000. And if you took the first step in your faith journey today by saying yes to Jesus, we want to know about it and we want to walk with you. So text Jesus to 43000. There you will find some resources and a message from Pastor John. There are so many ways to connect to Declaration. Check out declaration.org to find out more about who we are. Before we go, let's say our declaration together. Because of what the gospel has done in and to us, our lives exist to help people encounter and follow Jesus. We will devote ourselves to his word, his presence, and his people. We desire authenticity, intimacy, a heart of service, and to see his kingdom come. We are for Jesus and for people. Hey, have a great week. We're so glad you joined us. Bye for now.